Welcome back. Today I want to show you the final results of the binary classification GNN for the HIV dataset. The last weeks I've tried out a couple of things, so let's see what the outcomes look like. First, let's talk about the high level changes I worked on. As promised, I now included the edge features of the molecule into the GNN. This is pretty important as these features contain information about the bond type, for instance. I managed to include them using the graph transformer layer, which I will further explain in a second. Secondly, I set up a Bayesian hyperparameter search, which ran for the last weeks. Then I was able to get a smoother loss function by playing around with the loss itself, but also including basic techniques like batch normalization into the network. Finally, I discovered a bug in my validation split, which leaked some of the test data into the train set. So let's have a closer look at what went wrong here. As you might know, the dataset contains 40,000 molecules, which I've split 50-50 into test and train sets. On the train data, I applied oversampling to account for the class imbalance. Finally, I added caching to my code so that each of the processed molecules, including the edge and node features, is stored on my hard drive. This allows me to perform the pre-processing only once and after that I can always simply reload the data from the disk. As an ID for the file names, I use the index of the molecule in the data frame. Unfortunately, when loading a pandas data frame from a CSV file, the index is automatically reset. And of course, some of the samples now had the same ID as the test data. Therefore, these samples occurred in both datasets. Stupid mistake, but now it's fixed by a clear separation of train and test data. On the other hand, for the last video, this means that some of the metrics are simply wrong because the model already knew some of the test data. Now let's have a look at the current architecture of the model. I've built these blocks that consist of a graph transformer layer, then a linear transformation applied on the output, and finally batch normalization. I stack these blocks several times and every couple of layers I apply top k pooling to reduce the size of the graph. I also talked about this in the last video. The intermediate embeddings after each pooling step are aggregated into a global graph representation. The number of how many times I stack these blocks and how often I apply top k pooling was a classical hyperparameter in my hyperparameter search. Then the final graph representation is fed through a couple of linear transformations and in between I apply ReLU activation. The output of my network is a single value that is used in the loss function to determine the binary classification prediction. Here I use binary cross entropy loss with logits which internally applies the sigmoid function to squeeze the output between 0 and 1. That's actually also something that changed because previously I used the cross entropy loss with two model outputs. And that's pretty much the full architecture. I've uploaded the best hyperparameters on GitHub in case you're interested. So what is this graph transformer layer doing? I also have a dedicated video about the attention mechanism in GNNs which is quite similar to the following. First of all, there are several papers that adopted the transformer ideas to GNNs and I will only talk about the paper that is used in this PyTorch implementation. This paper doesn't use positional encodings, for instance, which are included in some of the other works. If you're interested, I'll link a couple of them in the video description. So let's start with the basics. We have a simple graph with node and edge features that are denoted as follows. The attention weights between nodes are calculated according to this formula. This is the attention weight alpha between node i and j. C stands for the attention head index, so for the case of multi-head attention. For simplicity we can just ignore it now and think of a single-headed attention mechanism. L stands for the layer, so we would start with layer 0. The attention coefficient tells us how much attention a node i should pay to a node j when aggregating the information. On the right side of this formula we see three terms. The queries Q, which are simply the transformed source nodes. The keys K, which are the target nodes. And finally the edge features E between nodes. So let's have a closer look at how these values are calculated. 
If we pick out one connection from the graph, we can easily see where Q, K and E come from. The source node features, the edge features and the target node features are all multiplied with a separate learnable weight matrix. That's essentially where the learning takes place. The output of this are Q, E and K. The edge features are then simply added to the keys and a dot product is performed with the queries. This means we multiply the vector of transformed source features with the vector of the transformed target features combined with the transformed edge features. Then this dot product is normalized with the size of each attention head and the exponential function is applied. This gives us the upper part of this formula. Remember this calculates the attention weight for one node pair. We can do the same for all nodes in the neighborhood of a specific node and then normalize the attention weights to get values between 0 and 1. A high value then indicates that the model should pay a lot of attention when performing aggregations and a low value means that this specific node is not too important for the aggregation. To perform this final aggregation, we first need to transform the original node embeddings with another learnable weight matrix. Then the node embeddings are simply calculated by multiplying each of the neighbors transformed node embeddings with the attention weights that we've just seen. This can be seen as a weighted average of the embeddings. So the more important an embedding is, the more it will be included into the updated representation. Furthermore, the edge features are also added in this aggregation. So actually it's not very difficult and this whole aggregation gives us an updated embedding for the node i. In the case of multi-head attention, this whole process is not calculated once, but in several streams. Therefore it will produce multiple outputs which are simply concatenated. Now let's have a look at how all of this is implemented in the code. So this is how the model file looks like. Here I define the graph neural network. And as you can see, everything is supposed to be relatively generic. So all I do is pass in this parameters dictionary, which comes from this config file. And all the model parameters are those, for instance, how many layers, the dropout rate, the embedding size, and so on. And then I use all of these parameters to generically generate the architecture of the model. What I always use is an initial transformer convolution layer that transforms the original node features to the node embeddings. And from that point, I then, depending on the hyperparameter search, apply several of these transformer layers. Then I use these linear layers to map the output size back because if I use several hats, the output size will be the embedding size times the number of hats. And then the batch normalization layer and every couple of layers, depending on the hyperparameters, I apply top K pooling to reduce the size of the graph. And this ratio, how strongly I reduce the graph also comes from here, different ratios. And then three of the linear layers which reduce until we get one output. And in the forward function I simply pass everything through these layers and to my global representation I append the global mean pooling, oh sorry, it's the global max pooling and the global average pooling of the node embeddings in this intermediate step. So the final representation is then passed through this classifier and I get one single output. So that's roughly the architecture. Let's also quickly have a look at the train script. Here I define this hyperparameter search using a library called Mango. And here I simply pass in the hyperparameters, which are simply ranges of different or sets of different values. And this hyperparameter search is using a Bayesian surrogate model in the background that tries to improve the hyperparameters for the next test iteration. And here I define this objective function, which is run one training. And what it returns is the best loss of this training so that the next set of parameters will be better than the previous one maybe. And then I just call minimize so that it minimizes the, the loss. Here you can see I get those parameters from the hyperparameter search 
and I pass them to the model, to the, so here is the model, the model parameters, to the optimizer and all of the things I need. For instance, the weight of the uh, cross entropy loss with logits is also a hyperparameter. And then I start the training, 300 epochs, and I also use early stopping. So in case the test loss doesn't improve, I abort the training and skip to the next iteration. I can also quickly show you ML flow where I track the experiments. As you can see, those are the different runs I did the last weeks. And I track pretty much everything I use. So the metrics like the precision recall ROC and also the parameters that I try out. And what is quite useful, you can compare different runs and then compare the parameters and also look at these plots to see if maybe some embedding sizes always perform worse and so on. Or you can also use this three dimensional plots where you can plot two variables against a metric or also this parallel coordinates plot. And if I go in here, I can see the test loss is now relatively smooth, decreasing and the train loss as well. And I also log the confusion matrix and other things here so I can quickly check how this model performed. So far so good, now let's lay the cards on the table. How did the model perform? I can tell you the accuracy is pretty good. With this model we are able to get almost 100% correct predictions. Oh, I forgot, the data set is imbalanced, right? So let's look at the right metrics and there the situation is much worse. Using 90% of the data as a train set we get roughly this confusion matrix. This means from these 4,000 molecules, roughly 3,700 or 800 are no HIV inhibitors and approximately 160 are HIV inhibitors. With the prediction model, we get a precision of 0.6. This means we capture 60% of the HIV inhibitors. However, we have a recall of 0.2. That means only every fifth prediction of HIV inhibitor is actually an HIV inhibitor. So that means we have a high false positives rate. So of course, overall, this is not very satisfying, but that's not the end of the road. In the background, I will continue to work on this model and update you whenever I achieve better results. Especially in the final parts, I want to deploy everything and build a simple dashboard around this. So we will certainly come back to this model. As promised, I will move on now with the series and try to generate new molecules with a generative model. My first attempt for this will be a graph variational autoencoder. This means the input molecule is transformed into a latent representation. This means the input molecule is transformed into a latent representation from which node embeddings are sampled and then used to recover the original molecule structure. Later this learned representation can then be used to generate new molecules by only using the decoder part of the network. Here I plan to condition on the type of molecule that I want to generate, which means either HIV inhibitor or not. As you can imagine, this is a pretty difficult task and I'm not sure if it will work and also how long it will take. Of course, I will keep you up to date with the progress and I hope to be able to upload an update every two weeks or so. So that's all for today. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.